Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Inner Circle Podcast. And it's no accident that you showed up here because this is where we transform your filmmaking career. And I'm Shane Hurlbut. I'm an ASC Ampass cinematographer. And I'm Lydia Hurlbut. I am a holistic coach and Reiki master. And we are so excited to have you join us for this episode. So let's dive in. Yes, we have an amazing guest today. Sherry Kauk, and she's a cinematographer. She's won Emmys. She's absolutely incredible. And we dragged her from uh, Utah. She literally flew on a plane, hopped in a car, came to this podcast, and we cannot wait to see what we discuss today. Lydia, take it away. We are so excited to have you in the studio with us. So welcome. And we also wanted to mention that you are one of our Filmmakers Academy coaches. So yes. we are even doubly excited to spend more time with you today. So let's start with your career trajectory, kind of getting to know what your story and history is a little bit more. Sure. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. This is uh, thrilling for me to make it into the studio with the both of you. It's lovely. Well, thank you. It's great to have you. And and uh, there has been such an amazing uh, request for your content. Mm -hmm. So uh, the more we can get you on uh, and have filmmakers really understand how you've uh, come up the ladder what your pitfalls were, what your successes were, what your failures were, all this thing. This is what we try to discuss on the Inner Circle podcast. It's kind of what no one wants to talk about sometimes, <laughs> and we want to talk about it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think definitely the, tra the trajectory is still in progress. I think every day it's... Um... Checking out, uh, is this is the North this still the North I thought it was yesterday or 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And I think that's one of the biggest awarenesses I've come into most recently is that the, tra the trajectory is always ongoing. Uh, I came into Los Angeles 20 years ago. Wow. And not probably still figuring out what all the crew positions were. I thought if you were at the camera, you were the filmmaker. And so it's been uh, the learning curve of knowing all the different department heads and all the people it takes to actually make the film and what is the, the, the multitude of definitions of filmmaker. And over the 20 years, I've stayed close to the camera because there's something um, that, that, you know, that's, that's, that's the heartbeat of it. That's, um, that's where all of the components t come together and that one critical moment of truth. And when you watch it through the lens or in, even when you're watching it on frame, you know if we have felt the truth in that moment of acting or in that moment of documentary. And you know when you haven't. And uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things is accepting when you know you haven't because it's a lot quieter. And then you can start talking yourself into it. Like immediately after cutting, you'll start talking yourself into it. No, it was good. It was good. But until you feel it, that moment, like, oh, we got it. Oh, I, I. That's the moment. Absolutely. I, I know when I'm back there in my cart and I'm watching a performance and I'm seeing that emotion and, oh my God, and then the looks that the other actors give within the scene and you're like, ah, you know, you're like giving high fives to the director and like, yeah, you know, it's so exciting when that magic happens. Yeah. And I think another part of that, of, of the career in the film and finding those moments is there's, there's kind of two trajectories. One's the long game because you have to well, a, keep learning every single day, but you also just have to survive. You have to not get burnt out. You have to stay excited and curious. And if something starts kind of dulling in a curiosity, then, okay, what else is sparking me? Like like the Nanlux, the lighting that just came out. I've sort of been on the edge with LEDs for a while. Maybe Aries or certain brands have become the norm. But when Nanlux came out, they they filled a place in LED lighting that really struck my curiosity. It was one of the first times I said, oh, that is like an M40. That is an M18. I can do an, 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 I can do an indie film on house power, yet still create contrast. Correct. Because there was a while when LEDs came out, we all moved to soft lighting. Yeah. And it was just, 
soft lighting, a soft LED through a soft grid, and now everything's lit and we're great. And uh, on an indie scale, and probably even on larger scales, just the quickness and the mobility of it. When, when Nanlux came out with their, what is the model number? I would say M40. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, 2400B. Yeah. And the 1200. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like the M18 and the yeah. M40, basically. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. when the 2400B came out and the 1200, I just recently used the 1200 on a dock shoot. Wow. It's great. No problem. We can so so I think also the tread the trajectory is finding ways to stay curious and stay in a in, in an investigative mode, and that doesn't all have to happen on set or in the act of a career. That's something for me that I'm learning as well. Some of my um, creative passions that are driving what I do on set are actually, let's say, with my back turned towards my turned away from my career. So I have an art practice now, or I have um, reading books just for the pleasure of it that have nothing to do with cinema. Yes. Yet somehow that keeps me turned on and curious for the projects that do come. That's such a great point, Sherry, because I think the hobbies, the time off, the forced time off that we've had between the pandemic Mm -hmm. and the strikes, it's really important to have coping mechanisms and things that are so positive for you outside of the the you know the craft Mm -hmm. that fuel your artistic spark Mm -hmm. and so let's let's rewind just a little bit before we continue down that rabbit hole because i love it but (laughs) i would love i know you were shane's first you were my first mentee the first mentee yes i love it (laughs) i say it with pride to your thousands of others (laughs) I was the first mentee. And Sherry's, <laughs> uh, Shane's parents introduced uh-huh. Sherry to yes. us uh, because they had met at church yeah. in Ithaca, New York. And yeah. so Sherry <laughs> moved to Los Angeles at that point. And then it was after- 2004, I think, or- It would have been in the 2004 range. You were yeah. in ca- uh, Canada doing the golf movie, The Greatest Game Ever right. Played. And I just and you came said, back Get and to I Canada. Said, yeah. And I said, no problem. And I drove up <laughs> and I showed up. You did. I did. And then the next one yeah. was uh, that. Uh, Sanaa like, Lathan film. Yes. Something new. Something new. Right. That's when you said, get to LA. And I said, okay. Yeah. And I drove up. Exactly. Yeah. You drove to LA and I'm exactly. like, all right, this is cable. Carry it. And it was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I might have cried one rainy day carrying that cable and having to inventory it on the belly. I might have cried. Shall. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I went out and bought my rain rain gear and I've never been wet on set again. So Exactly. Yeah, yeah. big lessons. Tough, tough yeah. lessons learned. Big lessons. So Sherry, you started in camera in the in the camera department or did you as a as an electrician? What how what was your path yeah. and how did you get in? I think it's interesting. We have uh, we have we have plans and strategies, and then there we have life that hits us. I came to LA, and you said get on the lighting trucks, and I showed up to something new on the lighting trucks, and I dropped a couple kinos, and I accidentally misfired at one point two, and I learned. I learned very quickly. But then um, the strike happened. That was the writer's strike fifteen years ago, yep. and that's also when the tax incentives really started changing the way filmmakers did productions in the United States. So your next few films and Hollywood's next few films are in New Mexico or um, Canada. Or yep. and at that point, I thought, well, I went to Canada and then I came to L.A. And I don't know what am I going to drive now to start chasing. <laughs> but what happened then? So I had started in lighting. And but with the strike, what happened? Uh, reality TV took off when the writers were on strike. And that yep. was the boom in reality. And I had just graduated AFI. I would learned what student loans were. And uh <laughs> Reality was there. But you know what also happened in reality TV? There is a contingent of women cinematographers now that came up through reality. Mm -hmm. Because when you're on a show, you are working with um, three, four, five, six camera operators. In reality, you can move quickly up to a certain point. So I AC'd a few shows, like maybe two, maybe two or three. And then I got to start bumping up for the wide shot. And then my body realized how heavy the cameras were, but then it got stronger. And I got a little bit better keeping her, the horizon, and you know, started working there. And before, just within the year or two, I'm I'm a legitimate operator on reality television, and that's 
completely different world from scripted, but it yeah. is a world close to the camera. And it was a world where a lot of women came up and became very vocal in, uh, in their leaderships and, and how they shared information with other camera operators and now cinematographers. And then when narrative filming then became really mobile when the digital cameras truly, when Red landed, but then when the, the first Ari came out and everybody was running and gunning and shooting long takes, we want that docu feel, that docu feel. Mm -hmm. It was the reality operators that then made the were called and made the leap back into scripted. So I started in lighting as much as I could. And also because of life and circumstances, I quickly became an operator. And then I've always been shooting on the side my cinematography projects. I nice. love I love that. And so as a female, yeah. how has it been for you? How has, you know, have what obstacles have you encountered? Um, what have you learned? Yeah. I'm probably blind to most of the obstacles only because if you if 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 something is in the shadows or just doesn't exist, you can't really even see it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened the first ten years of my career if it would have been different in another way. But as more women came onto set and as the need for a diverse crew and people who just, Maybe are diverse not just in gender, but are in uh, where are you from? Yeah. Um, what is your socioeconomic background? Like, just diverse in what point of view do you bring to set? Mm -hmm. As more of difference appeared on set, it became apparent. Like, oh wow! For example, I remember just a few years ago, I filled in, or I just a few years ago, I uh, worked on the L word and insecure, and. Two different experiences that hit me in two personal ways, but they were first for me after 15 years of working in the industry. I walked into the Insecure set. It was a female director. It was a female uh, show owner. Uh, Issa Rae owns, you know, uh, really had female cinematographers. And it, it's, it didn't become about who's the majority or who's not. It just became about suddenly there was a balance that I felt that I didn't even realize I was out of balance before. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I equate it with we speak different languages. I did, I did not grow up with brothers. I did not date men. So interestingly that 90% of the people I work with are men. And it's a, just a different life experience. Mm -hmm. And so the need and the act for me to learn a type of male intimacy, joking and bantering that I just don't know, um, or how, just how, how people can communicate. I kind of feel like I had to learn another language and I'm constantly trying to learn other languages. And um, some of the times I ask when I go into set, will you please learn my language now? <laughs> you know, please now, can you learn my language? But uh, I think it's really about finding the common language mm -hmm. and uh, working really hard to accept when we're not going to be fluent in each other's. And I know, Shane, since the very beginning, you were bringing people onto your sets that had never been on a set, me as, as, as an example. And um, it just was, again, wow, the, the, the film production world's different. The languaging's different. The, also, the, like, again, that camaraderie style's different. Yes. As, as, as more people realize we need to out of necessity of time and budget, but also out of necessity for community. When we get together on set, we're going to work overtime the first few days, first at the, at the beginning of the project to establish our language and establish how we banter. Mm -hmm. And uh, that then becomes the new norm, at least for that show. Well, I, I find that the point of view of when you have a female director, female producer, um, it's the point of view and the tone is so different and it's actually fantastic. I really, really love it. And I love the, the, the unique point of view, the way uh, the set uh, rolls out. It's, yeah. it's different. It's very different. It and is it, different. It's, it's different in such a good way that I think uh, really promotes getting the best out of every creative that's on set. And not to say that all the the male directors that I worked with and producers and everything, it was any different. I'm just saying it feels different. 
uh, is the end game the same? I think we're doing great work, whether it's, yeah. you know, driven by female or male. But the one thing I really love is just the tone and the point of view is unique. There's a, you know, and the tone I think comes from just being aware. We're not just in our um, comfort zone. No, and I think that's also a mothering instinct as well, mm -hmm. because yeah, like indeed. Mary Viola, who's at uh, Wonderland Sound and Vision, the way she protects us, mm -hmm. like I did four movies in the pandemic with their, mm -hmm. with that company, and Mary was so about keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. She, you know, really, we had these meetings where we brought the whole crew in and we're like, you know, we're getting us all back to work, right? Yeah. And during a pandemic when everyone's supposed to be you know still staying at home or whatever we're getting back to work we're get but we i want to protect you so please don't go out to clubs and stuff during the weekends and parties and all this stuff let's try to keep this as a tight-knit bubble uh so we can all stay healthy and we can get back to work with what we want to do and that really cemented that whole kind of you know taking care of us not just mm -hmm. by giving us the resources that needed for the movie but also this was the first time on set you could possibly die going to set it's, right it, you know it's so much different because there's such kind of glory in the old school ways right we were just hanging off the side of trucks and we were and there it's amazing it's so fun but oh how lovely to say, hey, we're going to do this, but we actually, we don't want you to get killed or hurt. Right. <laughs> like, is there a way we could potentially show up tomorrow again? Yeah. Uh, so I think there, there's a shift, that I, and I don't know, maybe it's we are more women on set, we have just a different outlook. Yeah. Um, I think it reminds me two stories I want to return real quick is the second time in LA, just a few years ago, I came in as an operator on The L Word. Also, a first time experience, I walked onto a set with so many queers, I'll just say so many queer, queer individuals. And I, I've i never felt so a part of the norm mm -hmm. in LA. And I just feeling that, I did get a first glance, a first glimpse of, is this what a man feels like every day he walks to set? It's just the norm. And so th there are these, there are experiences by either having more uh, individuals of LGBTQ or more individuals who identify as female, like when you can have those experience, more people get to actually experience what just normalcy feels like from my insides and having it seen. Yes. Right. And that to me, I, I just won't forget that feeling. Like I belong here. Yeah. Uh, without words, it's just, and the other story, uh, going back to how things can change, um, I think about the Ergo Rig. The, the, the guys that built it, they're seasoned operators. And I own one and many, many operators own one now. They built it with a brace on the right shoulder. That was the best concept because that's where the camera sits. In reality, the women, some of us, it didn't fit right for our chests. Some of us, it's fine. I, I used the right one for a long time. So the founders of Ergo went back into R&D and interviewed a lot of women operators, brought them out, gave them demos, and redesigned it to go down the, the, the center of the chest and that would allow it to fit more comfortably. It turns out as those models started coming into the fields and we were wearing them and then other people were wearing them, the, 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 company, the, the company owners realized that's actually the, the better fit. It actually centers better and sits better. So just mm -hmm. by them opening up to hear a certain smaller percentage of operators saying, we love your product, but it's uncomfortable. They went into all that resources and time. Cinema devices. Adam. Cinema devices. He yes, is. Adam, yes. I love yes. that man. And that has become their their default sell now because it's the better product. I love this so much because what I'm hearing, and just from the medical scientific side of it, which is my background, mm -hmm. it's very similar to all of the medical research, or the majority of it has been done on men, and. Yeah. <laughs> and and women are now saying, listen, we need research because our bodies are different. We're we're just mm -hmm. we're different. We have a different biochemistry. And so I think it's really about energetically having 
a, a really diverse, unique pool, both on set and in the medical field from all of the different research studies, yeah. right? To deliver information to inform and to give a better experience overall. And being curious and wanting all the other perspectives because yes. it just might, one, create a better product, but it just might keep everyone healthier in in their own need, in their own way. Yeah. Yes, and, physically, emotionally, mentally. Yeah. And I also don't mm -hmm. want to also be the guy that keeps on hearing, yeah, well, I'm an old white male and I can't get a job on set anymore. You know, all the females are taking over. I hear this on set all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm -hmm. guys, are you kidding me? This is... The artist is an artist, whether it's male, female, black, white, yellow, it doesn't matter. An artist is an artist and they have their voice and we need to, uh, you know, shine a light on that, whether it doesn't matter what the, what the sex is. And I find that this stigma that where the men have been in charge for so long and when you hear those growlings, mm -hmm. it just really cuts me to the core because I, I find that, you know, I don't want to ever be seen as that, uh, guy who is saying those type of things. That's just not that we need to all be together as one and appreciate each other's talents and just throw gasoline on that creativity, you know, whether it's mm. wherever it comes from. And you have to be able, though, to hear that creativity in different inflections or different ways. And that's where it is different being a woman sometimes, because we'll say it differently or quieter, or we might get mm -hmm. talked over. And so you have to really be wanting every, you know, wanting the creativity to rise. And I don't hear those gripes as much because I think most people know, don't say it out loud to, to certain people. Yeah. But all I can say is... We, uh, the International Collective of Female Cinematographers, we used to call ourselves the 2%. They have officially changed their name to the 3%. So I think 97% are safe. Like there's there's such a little variance to, I, I, I can't understand, but I can say, I accept that someone feels like, oh my gosh, my I didn't get hired because of this, but it's a 97% exactly. counterbalance. Yes. Counter, yes. So I... And I think it's also a power question because um, when people could not creatively express themselves and have it seen or even have the opportunity to be in a certain position, I think the shifting that we're now seeing really has to do with the rebalancing of power dynamic as well. And having people in positions of leadership and in positions of power that they've never had access to before. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, that change needs to keep happening. And I think we're only starting to see the beginning of it. But I think that rather than grumble, and this is so interesting to me, because I think if you can be curious and and wonder, wow, what do I need to do as a human being to change, to be more open, to maybe sharpen my skill set a little bit so that then I can be in a position to be hired and to not be overlooked? I think those are the questions that really need to be asked, right? right. Not just, well, I, I'm losing out because of a certain, you know, because I'm a certain sex and I'm frustrated by it. But it's like, take a look in the mirror and understand why, right? Mm. Understand why and work on your your own internal growth to, you know, change and shift a little bit so that you so that you can yeah. get into those positions again. I have to tell you, the younger individuals I work with, I am blown away. They, as opposed to what you're speaking to, Lydia, I have to catch myself sometimes because I come from a different, a different generation. Yes. And so I have to now make those questions to myself about certain prejudices and, and or my blind spots, right? Yes. Um, it, it's hard. It's so difficult. It, it, but I have to come to set or come to work every day and, and just try. Yes. And apologize or laugh or 
both too so it's like too about my own error or let let an error go by right if somebody mis- miscalls me in in some way or uh, uh, some type of offense if we're trying great let's check it off we tried and move on and do it differently next time it's a daily test for me but i have to tell you the younger generation that i have worked with i'm i like i said i'm blown away they don't they don't have some of these um like my generation i'm very polite on set mm-hmm. or as a, as a woman as well i'm a little bit soft more soft spoken there is no i'm just i'm just happy to be there sometimes that's something i have to work through the young people oh no no this is their position and their role and they own it and I get inspired both directions. Oh, wow. You can just show up in spandy pants and rock the focus and throw a camera on your shoulder and say, move the, you know. Wow, I'm stunned. It's happening. People are changing. But also what I see on set now, um, the people I do kind of gather over and over with as my team, the men I work with and the women, we can sort of land in our masculine or feminine energy on different ends of the scales. And to me, that becomes actually the invisible factor is how are you bringing those two energies to set? I was going to say everything comes down to energy and Sherry, you're speaking my language, (laughs) but I think that it really is, it becomes an energetic exchange at the end of the day and really figuring out how how the energy shift and balance occurs based on what's needed in that moment, right? Because it mm-hmm. it's very different depending on the role that you have. So let's talk leadership for a second, because I'm dying to know how, what do you like as a leader on set? How do you, you know, when you go as the cinematographer, how do you lead your team? How do you run your set? I think I'm still learning. I really do. I can look back at the last three projects and see progress in that area. Mm-hmm. And I can look at the one I'm on now, the way I've shown up. We are on day two and we're still learning people's names. <laughs> I have I got to bring in one operator with me and and the gaffer. So and and actually the showrunner brought me on. So we have a, a few of us are known. I'm the second unit DP on the show. And so the DP who came from with the production company, he graciously let me pick the my my biop, and so he and I are getting to know each other. What are our personalities? And, um, and then I have been, of course, merged into a local crew, and I can see how on this show in particular, in, uh, particularly because we are separate units most of the time. I'm like, okay, we need to function as one, and function as one pretty quickly. But we have to also be able to, at the end of each day, say what worked, what didn't. We have to be able to critique our performance on the day. And what are we going to do differently tomorrow or what are we going to do the same? And I'm trying to learn to bring those conversations out actively. I think you have to create the environment you want. And um, I send a daily email at, uh, each evening. I go through the schedules. Okay, this is what we're going to do. A camera at this location is going to be on this lens, this lens. B camera will be on this setup. And we're going to have our FS6 right now on the show on backup, ready to go with this lens. Uh, The next location is going to look, and I'll go through the day. And at the end, uh, uh, my BOP, Dan Cavanaugh, he mentioned, why don't you put everyone's names and contacts right there so we have it quickly. And then I added a third column with just a little... For me, the first two days, it was, where's my, because I was discombobulated, Where, where's my coat? Where's where's my ergo rig? Where's my, and Dan's from Jersey, so he got, go Dodgers, right? So we just start putting these little lines, and now each day we can update them. I'm no longer, where's my? I got it under control. <laughs> I've, I've graduated. I know where my gear is now. But, and it's also making, when I run into somebody the first few days, I'll take a guess at their name or I'll just ask them, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Until I get it. And then I'll work really, really hard until I know everyone's names. Um, so I think I think these are leadership qualities. I asked uh, the AC when we had our first phone call. She asked me, what do I like? I say, I just want, a bo- before anything else, bring in my camera to the settings on sticks. 
then do whatever you need to do. And the first day on set, that camera was sitting there on set, ready to go. And I made a point to go up and thank her. Thank you so much for remembering that from three weeks ago. I had forgotten, but when I saw my camera there, I was able to just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think calling people out, requesting what you need, and then pivoting if it's not working quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And and your background, um, so let's just kind of go through, I know that you've done incredible documentary work, um, TV, you've had, you've had a broad and um, drugstore June, which is so exciting. Yeah. So I guess I'd love to hear what, what are the, the biggest challenges or takeaways that, that you've learned? Because a lot of times when you're going into something like pivoting from documentaries to TV, it's, there's similarities, I'm sure, but but there, it's it's totally different in terms of the performance, what you need to deliver as, you know, as the DP, as the camera operator. So I, I just love to hear kind of what have the challenges been for you? What do you think you've done really, really well in in pivoting or, you know, um, and we just talked about like how you loved the comedy genre with Drugstore <laughs> June. But before you had done that project, you might have not thought it was as exciting as it was until you did it. I I do. I have my feet and my toes in many, many areas. I yeah. shoot reality, but we call it docu-series. I shoot documentary. We call it real documentary. And I shoot scripted. I shoot uh, narrative features and I work in television. And that's a lot. And um I, I don't, I, to that, I don't know. I thought I was going to move to LA, become a gaffer, move up to cinematography and rock the world. I thought like, this is great. I've got a plan. Brilliant. We'll be executed in less than five years. Perfect. And then life happens. So part of that is life happens and I react to it. But part of that is also, I think what really, what really does connect. And in all of those scenarios, most of the time I'm at the camera. And so when I'm at the camera, then it just becomes about what does that genre, um, it's going to elevate in terms of importance. What can I control or not control in that style of shooting? So in documentary, you have a, I need to be mobile. I need to make multiple sizes of frame at the same time. Um, I need to be able to hear what they're saying, the, wh whoever like, the cast or whoever the individual were documenting. And I need to be able to work with natural light quickly. In reality or docu series, it's I need to be a bit of a jack of all trades. I won't have the crew size. I need to be able to make two cameras act as six. I need to be able to drop into any location and um, make a, a lighting adjustment and a frame and a blocking adjustment in 10 minutes and be ready to go. I do have resources. We can light, I can choose lenses, I can set a look and a style and a feel. But it is at the same time very much um, on the go. And in scripted, and in scripted, it's I have a script. I get to react to the script, right? We get to contemplate the script. We get to location scout the script. And then all hell breaks loose anyway. But it, it's just different worlds. Um, so I don't know that there was a strategy in terms of I think I'll be able to do all things. Uh, that's why I was. Mm -hmm. I guess which one do you gravitate? You, nonetheless of what you've done mm -hmm. what one you know sparks your heart narrative feature filmmaking is the thing that drives the long-term desire to show up every day yes narrative feature filmmaking is n not the most viable career choice right now you have uh, super blockbuster marvels and then you have indies yeah. And so whatever drives the long-term game, there still has to be a constant ex uh, negotiating with reality. A lot of television, some of good dramatic television can feel like you're making a mini movie each yes. hour. Yeah. But the production process of television is one that you do that for one or two seasons and you're burnt out. So there's a, there's, 
but still when you're when you're in those moments when you know you've made a filmic scene or you know you've just really delivered an episode that is a full human journey you get pumped and re-energized but television is something you have to recover from but that's why when indie features like drugstore june do come up and even if they are low budget Mm -hmm. but the script is there the the director's creative is there and you can see the producers and everyone putting in all their favors. The Panavision show up. The MBSs show up for you. That's yeah. when you say, clear everything. We want to go all in. As if this was the $100 million film. And that is part of the long game. When you get these gems mm-hmm. and we don't look at the paycheck. <laughs> we just show up every day and say, this <laughs> is why we showed up 20 years ago. Yeah. The paycheck will come in the next one or, you know, we don't know. (laughs) Yes. But I think you brought up so many important points, Sherry, because careers are not linear. Mm. There's twists and turns. And I think what happens in our mind's eye, and I had this too, but again, in the medical field, but you have goals that you set for yourself and you have an Mm -hmm. agenda and you will accomplish it on this timeline. And it's very important to understand all of the different things pulling at you, right? There's the financial tug. There's the creative tug. There's the why is this taking so long because I think I'm talented and I think I should have what I consider to have arrived mm-hmm. a lot sooner than I have, right? Yeah. And and this is the mental game that we play. But I think... If you can, um, and you spoke to this so brilliantly, enjoy the moment and understand what is required based on whatever project that you're on and give it your all. You're a filmmaker at the end of the day. Whether you're a perfect narrative, storytelling, paycheck-driven filmmaker, at the end of the day, you get to do what you love. And you're really good at it, right? And so one other part of this question is you've won an Emmy, which is extraordinary. Did that change your world? I think everybody also thinks, oh my gosh, if I just if I just get the award, my whole career in that moment will blow open and everything, it'll be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I do believe that for the Oscars. Okay. Although I think your life's already changed if you're at the Oscars, but I do believe that. For, I, if I get one, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> I do believe that. I still believe it. I'll put it that way. I believed it for the Emmy as well, but no, my life did not change. What actually happened is I was told, well, that wasn't the right Emmy. Nice. <laughs> how, how that wasn't the right Emmy. Emmy. That's right. It was the wrong type of Emmy or the wrong type of category. You know, so, But please call us when you get the right Emmy. Uh, that was the response. But what it does do, <laughs> what it, it's still beautiful on the mantle. It has, it's, it's a legit heavy trophy. It's great. It's a yes. good trophy. But what it does do, Lydia, is um, it is a type of measurement because we can get lost in over the years. And in L.A., it's always sunny. We don't even know how many years it's been. We can get lost in the process of becoming the thing we want to become. But there are these markers. Yes. Uh, the Emmy was a marker for me, and it was in lighting design. So I did achieve some goal in being able to film with the lighting intention first, right? Um, becoming, uh, being recognized as uh, Variety's up-and-coming cinematographer. Maybe got a few phone calls, but my car didn't change, and my upcoming job list didn't change. But I did. It was a. It was a marker. Yes. Uh, In your studio, I ran into George Billinger, who I was an operator for. That was a marker because suddenly I was having lunch with Shane and George, and I was there listening and telling stories and participating. That's a marker. So I think that's what the Emmy is. That's what different events are or moments um, in, in a full career trajectory for sure. Yes. And I, that is beautifully stated, Sherry. And I think it's so important from the mental perspective to 
manage how hard we are on ourselves and to really also see like, wow, as you say, I've had markers in time. I'm seeing really huge momentum moving forward based on the markers, right? So what, how do you uh, keep yourself mentally excited um, about your career preventing burnout? Because you work a lot and um, as you said, when you do television, it's really important to have downtime afterwards because you're physically exhausted from the job. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you balance it all, kind of the work-life balance, preventing burnout, and, and keeping mentally, everything's a mind game, right? Especially in this industry. You know, I think at the beginning of my career, I tried to do it, I, I thought it was all me having to do me. I thought it was all about my cinematography, my career growth. Um, as I've gotten more experience and as I've been in the, 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 the game a lot longer, and that's something that men are really good about. I listen, it, when you hear guys on set talking, it's about who I worked with, their name, what year it was on that project, and this happened. Oh, I remember that. They're so good at um, creating a system of, of, of experiences and camaraderie, which then also communicates a familiarity. I'm one of you and you're one of me. Oh, we've been there. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that at the beginning. I just didn't have that skill. I didn't know that was a part of life. I thought I just showed up with my goal and did my thing. Mm -hmm. What I'm really learning now is the projects for me, I find joy in discovering who the people are about the projects. For example, in Drugstore June script, First of all, it was um, uh, Seamus Tierney, a cinematographer. He called to recommend me for the job because he was no longer available. So that's something cinematographers do have that I started learning this, this skill. Give and share and make others a part of my experience and then be a part of their experience. Yes. That is something that has become more and more critical to me, but also has given me so many more gifts than maybe many of my solo expeditions. So Seamus recommended me to uh, this feature and I read the script and who knows what I was doing that week or that month, but this was a comedy that came in, kind of a farcical adventure comedy. And I was like trying to find the meaning. It ended up being like, I hope, and I think it's going to be a classic stoner film. I don't really know what the meaning of those films are, except for they're really, really fun. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until I was just, I don't want to say let go of the script, but opened up to, well, Nick, who's the director, Nick Goosen, why are you on the project? Oh, you you and the comedian, um, Esther, uh, you started collaborating. Why, why, why is everybody else involved? Mm -hmm. Then that opens me up to their their reasoning, and then I can return to the script. Um, on the show I'm on right now, it's a showrunner I've worked five five shows for. Wow. So one, it's a delight and saying, oh, how how can we work together again in a, and even expand that? There's a type of intimacy on set that you have to develop with each other, right? It's a work intimacy. And, um, and, so, and also in this job, like, who can I bring with me who will create that interconnectedness? And who's game for that? And who knows it's about the people we're working with as mm -hmm. much as the, the, the script and the project, because that actually is what opens up the script a lot of time. So trying to discover more about the people I'm around and their whys helps me discover the whys of a project. Yeah, I was talking with George about, you know, the ability of, I thought I had to solve all problems. Oh. Yeah. Right. You know, I thought, OK, I'm the cinematographer. I'm the head of my grip electric camera department. I have to have all the answers. And then I was like, yeah, but my key grip and my gaffer and my first AC and my team can actually help me out with this. Yeah. Why don't I start asking them to solve the problems instead of putting that all on me? Yeah. And that's been a really big thing for me is to come out of the micromanaging scenario that I've had, you know, the last two, the beginning two thirds of my career where I thought I had to solve everything and I had to have the answer to everything. And if I didn't know it, I had to research it and go down the, the rabbit hole of that 
where I could just turn to my key grip and say, okay, I want this truss and I want these lights figured out, you know, instead of me having to think about, okay, yeah, and then I do research on it and figure out what the right grain is and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, why am I wasting that time you know, yeah. when I can be, you know, mm -hmm. doing many other things with my creativity than micromanaging every department? That's been one of my goals for this year. It's actually just this year now. That's been one of my goals for the last year. Instead of when I have a question going to Google, just t uh, just pausing moment and say, who could I talk to about this? Exactly. Because me having a problem to solve can engage me in conversation with someone and then open that connection again. And you can solve it together. And you can solve it together probably quicker and have two minds on it. Yes. That's when I was a B camera operator on the Big Leap and George Billinger was the AOP and Jim Froner was the DP, I watched those two work together and those two with the, the director, the showrunner at the time. I had never seen that type of collaboration, but that type of co-leadership in problem solving. And also that, that type of trust, because Jim would be working with the gaffer or working with, and, and, and in the blocking and, and uh, George would be there. And I'd never really seen how that role of the A camera operator as a visualizer as well and part of that conversation, it just really blew me away because I'd ne never really seen a DP be okay with others making the decisions like that. Mm -hmm. And so watching Jim lead like that really just kind of set me back and made me think about how, yeah. oh, wow, how can I do it differently? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's exactly right. And mm -hmm. you... You empower the team as well mm -hmm. uh, because they feel very uh, that they help solve the problem with you. Yeah. But I think the more instead of just saying to like, you know, hey, here's the trust, figure it out how I'm going to do it. It is so much better to fuel off of each other and mm -hmm. say, OK, so this is what I was thinking. How do you how do you how, how are we going to do this? And then he or she might say something that then sparks an experience that you had way back 10, 12 years ago. And, oh, yes, we could do this. And then you just, you you build on each other instead of yeah. you having to make all those decisions. And I, I have to say, it stresses me out. And I have worked with a series of first-time directors that I absolutely love doing, uh, but it is very exhausting. It takes a lot because you are doing a lot more uh, of the job than you would necessarily do. Yeah. Uh, and with that comes the stress and the time and uh, all the plotting, blocking schematics, all the mm -hmm. stuff to make you as prepared mm -hmm. as possible and for them to shine as bright as they can. Uh so that that whole thing is, you know, just trying to let go of the control. And it's not playing dumb. No. It's like you said, keeping it conversational. You know, if we need we need a certain amount of light. I'm thinking I'm thinking tighten tubes over the window seal. What are you thinking? Oh, well, instead we could I've got this other unit on the truck. I, I could actually do moonlight with the 1200 and just have it grace it. Oh, yeah. Moonlight sounds great. Let's do that instead. It's it's conversational for sure. Yeah, it is. And I think what you're talking about, Shane, is so interesting as well, because it's the mental stress. It's the decision making. It is the the how many decisions do you make on set in a day? Thousands. What do we mm. want to do for this? What do we want to do for that? The questions keep coming no matter how well you prep it, because things happen. Right. And even if you're trusting your team to do their job, which they're doing brilliantly, there's still questions. There's still last minute things. All of a sudden it rains. Something happens. The light goes, yeah. you know, do we need to turn the lights on across the lake? Whatever it is. And so I think, how do you manage that mental stress, Sherry, and stress in general? Because um, time pressures stress, you know, not feeling like you can ever get enough shots to, you know, or be able to make your day. Um, how do you handle the, you know, all of that? Yeah, I turn the heat on, man. The AC just keeps on. 
<laughs> I hope you can't see. I'm literally shaking. I turned the heat on, Lydia. I have temperature <laughs> control in my hotel room and I turned the heat on and I should have worn my undershirt. Um, <laughs> that's how I do it. Step one, turn the heat on. Um, how do you manage it? I think um, first I take joy. I take joy in that I want to be doing it. Yeah, I really do want to be doing that. I'm so grateful every day walking on set. Yeah. It, coming in here, doing these interviews, yeah. just being able to, you know, work with the team and and talk about uh, light and movies and what people saw and what they liked and what they didn't. It's it's so, it, it fires me up. I Like I said, I always feel like a five-year-old when I'm on set because yeah. I'm in that sandbox playing with the little army guys and blowing stuff <laughs> yeah. up and, you know, doing all that stuff when I was a little kid, you know? Yeah. yeah. And when I'm making my shooting plans the night before, when, I, when I'm preparing that quick quick sheet, I do gauge like how much energy do I have left for the night? Do I have to finish this right now? Can I pick it up in the morning or can it just be let go? And I do make those choices and those quick sheets are very important to me. Okay, I'm going to do those. What might I have to give? Um, when I'm when I'm still learning, when I when I do go into production, mm -hmm. we just came out of a strike, so I had a three hour from like four to seven a.m. I would wake up and go into what I called my art studio hours. Or my office, my art, uh, my studio hours, and I would do an art practice because even though we were on strike, once that sun comes up, I really felt obligated. I felt obligated to, at first, find a job, look for a new job, get, change careers, or no, I know we were all <laughs> we were panicking, right? We were all looking well, for a pivot. What are we going to do? Oh, yeah, how am I going to pivot? I really stressed the first bit, but once I just accepted it, then that's where uh, a I'll change a subject a little bit during the pandemic, the first pandemic. I really bulldozed my way through it, trying to work. And if I couldn't work on set, I was going to work on my website. If I couldn't work on my website, I was going to work on a, a startup company. Like I worked so hard through the pandemic, I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. So when the strike came around, I was like, aha, we're going to do this one differently and accept it. Um, so so I got into a beautiful, I got into an amazing self-care flow during the strike. I was like <laughs> epically self-caring. It was brilliant. I love it. So what did you do? Tell us what you did. Well, you I had your art. Four to seven was art. <laughs> from seven to 10 were my, I am uh, pitching and developing shows. So, so seven to 10, so these three hour blocks. And don't worry, I had like my, my first I did my lemon water with a little salt and then my coffee and then my nutritional drink. And then I would take a break. And then the the rest of the day was how it needed to transpire for life and logistics. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be done around six and I would wind down and go to bed around eight. It was brilliant. <laughs> it was like the best. <laughs> and I live in the mountain home. Yeah. So it was also just like, I'm going to be expecting in two years, another year off. That's If it doesn't happen this way, I'm going to start asking what's going on. Every two years, we get a year off. This is the new standard. <laughs> I'm ready for it. So moving back into production, I was a little rusty, but I'm laughing at myself. I'm still trying to schedule waking up early. How early can I wake up to not exhaust myself? This, this, this morning, it was just one little extra hour. Some mornings, it's two hours. I can get away with it. Mm -hmm. But I have to start gauging that at the end of the night. I have to start gauging that at the end of the night if I can really handle that. Yes. Um, and I think yeah. what it's so great that you're aware of your energy and recognizing that everybody's different. And I heard this wonderful thing recently where it's all about the little micro workouts. So mm -hmm. it's more than habit stacking. Mm -hmm. It's you literally try to put in micro workouts, let's say three reps of 10, while your coffee's brewing with, you know, weights. Mm -hmm. So you're you're really almost um, figuring out how to use the time to your best possible advantage. But rather than stack an additional habit and do the same kind of routine every day, it's really about switching it up and putting in these little tiny micro workouts throughout the day that add up to an amazing workout but you just haven't done it straight through. So I'm does constantly... It up? Does it add up? It does physically? add up. It, add, it oh, adds great. up physically, which is really interesting. 
And so I'm constantly trying to stay abreast of like, what are the little tricks? Because we all have the same 24 hour period and, and we all need the sleep of Mm -hmm. supposedly eight hours, which is a lot for filmmakers, right? Especially uh, when you're on a TV show. So how do you maximize every single minute without driving yourself insane? I don't know, Lydia. I think, I think, I'm going to do that because I'm, I'm working on my flexibility. So while my hot water's boiling, yeah. I'll be trying, exactly. to, trying to get thing. into a downward dog and get out of it. <laughs> yeah. I think getting out is the hardest. But um, I think the key for me is not trying to maximize every moment. Yes. No, that's that, true. That becomes, that's something that becomes like um, a self-judging addiction almost. Like, I'm not doing anything right now. I should be doing something right now. Yes. So I, I, I accept Downward dogs during the water boiling. Yeah, I'll do it. Yes. And I don't mean throw a plank, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And and you don't want to add more mental stress. I think it's the, I said that wrong, the limited amount of time that you have, how can you, when you are not trying to relax, really maximize what the, the moments in time to your greatest benefit. That's, that is really, I think, where it's at. And because everybody, there's so many billionaires and people that you follow at on social media, or at least that I do, that are constantly like, what can you do now? Oh my gosh, you're not taking this supplement. It can become completely overwhelming and exhausting, right? And how do you know what works and what doesn't work? So I think for filmmakers, I really view everybody as an athlete. And so as an athlete, how can you maximize your performance, feel great in your yeah. skin, and have time for de-stressing, especially from all of the mental... Completely. The me- because it's the mental stress that gets... I think that gets to people and you may not be as aware of as you are of like physical stress and exhaustion. I think one thing too that helps me get time back. Yes. That I've really started um, engaging in is what can I do right now? Instead of scheduling, oh, Sherry, don't forget to send an email tomorrow. Why don't I just send the email right now? What can I actually do right now? And then it just poof, it's done. So I have a lot more direct conversations in the moment. I will just call someone Mm -hmm. and have a quick conversation as opposed to let me type this conversation out into three back and forth. Let me just have one. And I even noticed that with uh, recently lens tests, I used to, they're not the most scientific, but I used to spend all the energy making sure the filming of the test was so perfect I could go back and review it, which I love the opportunity to review it, but I half the time don't have time to review it. Mm -hmm. So in my lens test now, I almost don't care for filming it. I just want to be looking at it right now and talking about what do we see. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And if what I does think, it feel like? What does that feel like? I, you know, wow. How is there? Why does this one feel flatter? Is this one has more separation? What is that? What compo- Let's put that other lens on right now because it felt different. Okay, let's put the other one back on. And within one hour of a lens test or a two hours lens test, I actually come out with a conclusion in my mind, out of a, a out of a, a an experience of being present right there I, that doesn't require shooting it uh-huh. going to the lab projecting it all that kind of stuff yeah. yeah i i found the same thing i mean i think that's because as technology is getting better the sensors are getting so much closer like mm-hmm. it used to be this way 10 years ago now it's like mm-hmm. this yeah. i think that now it's not necessarily testing the cameras and everything so much. It's really finding the soul of your project, which is a lens and finding Mm -hmm. that and doing the research. And now the lens market has gone explosions. Uh, You know, I'm making a lens. Are you making a lens? Yeah, I have. Do you have your lens? I know everyone's got their own lens. We could just, it's it's like, what's happening? (laughs) But it is exciting. But it's like, why don't I have a lens? I feel feel so far behind. (laughs) I am not legitimate. I don't have a lens. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yeah. But you know what? Also on this, some shows, it doesn't happen often, but um, my dog travels with me. Mm. And I will say having another little creature Mm -hmm. that forces me to go for a walk in the morning. Or to go for a hike in the morning, to just 
receive a little photo at lunch, the little happy dog with her dog walker, or in the evenings after we've wrapped out or say, oh, I have to go and allow myself to go and take a walk. Mm -hmm. And just I'm kind of forced into that on some projects. But seeing that the project still continues perfectly fine, it enables me on projects when I don't have that requirement to say, oh, I'm going to swim this morning. I'm going to leave set just after wrap if I can, so I can go for a walk. Yes. And I learned that the, the, the set still happens. I also think I'm learning to give myself permission because let's say I show up right at call, not early, to help or be supportive. That's okay because I was up till 10 sending out my, hot, my, my quick sheets or I was on my phone doing something with this. I think allowing me to have be on 24-7 but then also to say no. Because I'm on at different times. It's, just, it's more like the self-defined outside of the hours. And it's grace. It's, it's allowing grace for yourself, for the situation. We're not all built the same. We're not all made the same. We all have different capacities mm -hmm. of energy, of what we can handle, right? Of more rest might be needed a little bit or just a little bit of emotional decompression or downtime, yeah. right? And I think it's it's knowing yourself. And because if I had to keep up with Shane or all that, I would be in real trouble. You know, I, I would be exhausted because he just has more energy than I do. And so I think <laughs> it is, he's like the energizer bunny. And I think it's, it's knowing yourself and really knowing what your needs are for this long, yeah. long haul of a career because, you know, you want to be your best in it. Mm -hmm. I think, too, it's, if it's right for you, it's great in terms of what you need to do to arrive ready to go. Yes. Uh, I live an hour and a half outside of L.A. in the mountains. I put snow chains on in the winter. And I truck into L.A. with snow blowing off the top of my car and I'm bundled up. And I was like, what, what are you doing? You know, I, I show up. What are you doing in a parka? Like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm in L.A. now. <laughs> it doesn't make sense for me, for an individual who's building a career to, quote unquote, be so far away from the kind of epicenter. But it's right for me because what I've learned what I do need is I need recovery time. Mm -hmm. And so when I go home, I'm basically going home to a retreat and it's silent and you know, expansive. And that fills me back up. And I don't mind an hour and a half drive through the National Forest to get into Mayhem LA, because then when I get to LA, it's a treat and I'm revved up to go. So that is something that was right for me. Mm -hmm. And I think also over the last 20 years, it's really learning to hear that voice. What, what, what that little voice is saying, oh, we really like this, or we want to go try that out. It can be a little bit quieter at first, it's but so when good. You get tapped into that voice inside you. Like, I was just recently working in London, and we had the option to stay out in this area that was 10 minutes from the sound stage that was way out in the middle of nowhere, or we could be in London proper in the heart of the city. Mm -hmm. That excites me. That fuels me. The drive is an hour and a half, just like you, mm -hmm. even though it was only 21 miles, but with <laughs> London traffic, it was an hour and a half every day there and back. So three hours was added on to my 12 to 14 hour yeah. day just with that. But it was worth it to me to sacrifice that part because I was able to fill myself up yeah at the beautiful hotel in the middle of London, mm -hmm. I was able to enjoy beautiful, f amazing food and great wine and, you know, a uh, window shop as I walked down yeah. the streets of fashion and, and look at the store windows and like, oh my God, these guys in London are bringing this store window shit. You know, it's like, <laughs> and it was the holidays and then oh, the yeah. lights were coming out and, <laughs> Yeah. So that was so much better than being put into like an embassy suites mm -hmm. that was going to be very nice and close and convenient to the to the uh, soundstage, okay. 
I chose filling myself up with culture and yeah. community of being in there and not isolated out in the middle of nowhere that no one really wanted to yeah. go to. Yeah, and talk about down, talk about winding down that drive home. Yes. It's a winding down process. I do lose a little bit of like, oh, when I get home, I can do that on, on the computer mm -hmm. or not. But that's when you can just call someone yes. or don't and just let it simmer, let the day simmer. And then the next morning, get ramped up as you're driving to work. And for me, there's something about being awake before the sun. When I'm awake and right now it's winter, I start the fire, start my little drink routine. There's something magical about being awake before the world wakes up. Mm -hmm. And it just gets me going. And then it just starts building and building and building. And then when the sun pops up, I'm like, oh, yeah, hello. I've been ready for you. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, I love it. Lydia is that way. She gets up <laughs> so up. early in the morning and yeah. I'm like in bed. And then she's like run, running around like crazy. That's <laughs> when your energy is. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. I just want to <laughs> sit in bed and just like, you know, wake up a little bit. No. You know, she's like, -da 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 I've done this and I've done that. And when are we going? And when are we? I'm like, Jesus Christ, you're coming at me like a machine gun. You know, I, I just want to Zen and get up to. <laughs> Uh, like have my body I'm not wake that up. Bad. I <laughs> I literally am a morning person, so I totally understand. I it. used to be a morning person growing up on the farm. I had you to be were. up at five a.m. Yeah. all the time, yeah. and it's like in our industry we have to do that a lot. And when I don't have to do that, I don't want to do that. Yeah, because I consider I it being. So I, if I have too early of a call, I'm like, you're robbing me of my morning time. I know, exactly. <laughs> this is my time. <laughs> That's so funny. But it is funny though. My my dear friends and now my my people I work with, they know if you want to talk to me after eight thirty, you better send me like a pre day heads up because I'll probably be asleep. Yes, and that's that's another bizarre choice, right? How are you asleep at eight thirty? Well, I wake up right. Yeah. So we make these little decisions. Why would anyone drive an hour and a half to work every day by choice? Yeah. Because that's what fuels you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I find that we work so hard and so long that what I found out on on location doing this for 30 plus years is if you do not when you get when you wrap if you just go back to your hotel room or your Airbnb mm. or wherever you are and you just then uh cook something and then watch some TV and go to bed that is giving in to the business. That is the business rules you. That's what I mean. You have to actually create within your zone that little world that you want. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I, you know, yeah. I look forward to where are we going to dinner tonight? Mm -hmm. What wine are we going to get? It's yeah. like that is takes me out of the completely on set experience, you know, refills me with like you know, walking down the street and just looking at architecture while we're heading to the restaurant, all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. that, that is so about wherever you are in the world shooting, kind of absorb that culture and yeah. feel it mm -hmm. and want it. That's what keeps you not burning out and is going to fuel a very long, successful career. Because I've been there where I just go in go back to the place, cook my food, go to bed, and I just feel soulless because I'm not experiencing life. And whether I get five hours of sleep because I went out and had a really nice meal, we had great conversation with like, you know, my operators and my first ACs or whatever, that's far superior than getting three more hours of sleep to be eight hours because that's filling me up with mm -hmm. conversation and stuff that's not yeah. about work. And it's, it's, yeah. it, refuels the mind so we can hit it again you know and on the budget side it's it's also if there is less money if it's tighter you could get really creative i mean you've had projects where they've cooked together you know and if there have been a bunch of foodies right everybody brings a dish or we all go to somebody's apartment yep. or whatever and cook together so i think that there's so many 
Uh, there's a variety of ways to tackle it, but I think it's mm-hmm. really knowing yourself. It's knowing what you need and it's knowing what fuels your creative soul. And I think it's it's risking saying this is this is what I want. Like this is what I want this experience to be. Yes. Uh, I know now sometimes crew, if we work together, we will pitch to the production. We will take an Airbnb. We would rather co-live for a few weeks mm-hmm. than being in our separate in hotel rooms because we like the house, we like the yard. We, there's different ways you can yes. create that environment. I remember the first 10 years of traveling to all the places of the world, on wrap I would fly home because I just didn't imagine that just if I could spend a little more time. I know, I money. spent three or four days. And then it just hit me one day, what are you doing? You never, so, <laughs> I, you might come back, but what are you doing? And that's it. Like, how can I make where I'm at right now magical? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's it. Um, We're always running to the next gig. And I just, I just stop that. It's like, as much as I miss Lydia and the family, I need three or four days where I can just like, walk around and not have to worry about waking up early. And then, you know, I'd like to see a museum today. Yes. I, I want to go see the Parthenon, uh, you know, what the hell were those? Ta- Parthenon tablets or whatever. They oh were at the goodness. British Museum. Yeah. Yes. And I just wanted just to go. see them. Yeah. And I just went, you know, yeah. on that, the last three days that I, I, uh, and everyone's like, why are you still here? We're, I'm heading back here. And everybody, I'm like, no, 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 this is, this is my time to decompress. And what it actually does is it gets me back into the family circle much easier than just mm-hmm. jumping right back mm-hmm. because I can decompress. I can get myself in a mindset of like, okay, it's not fight or flight in regards to every day. There's some kind of a curveball, all this kind of stuff. And then I can get home and I can tackle yeah. that environment. But you know what else? Because we're filmmakers, but we're also living our one human experience, we can go to that museum and see the tablets because you are, you are more than a filmmaker. Exactly. You, are, you are a living, you are here. Yes. Yeah. And then actually, if you, if you can start just saying, I'm here, what can I do right now? You bring that to set. Like ye- yesterday evening, we were on set. Um, Justin Danino, our gaffer, was so thrilled. He had this unit. He put moonlight in and it had this beautiful um, pattern on the wall when it came through. And just before we went to film, I said, look at that. Do you see that? And our producer and our coordinator were there. And he said, yeah, we see that. That's Justin's. He did that. That's awesome. <laughs> and our coordinator just kind of chuckled. Yeah. Then I went on the walkie. Justin, that's awesome. The moon is here. <laughs> it just being, because just, I saw it. That's great. Let's call it out right now. Yeah. Uh, I think the more I can bring that into my everyday, yes, at work and wherever I'm at, that just it just makes us alive, reminds us that we are alive in this moment. Yeah, yeah, so great, Sherry. Where do you see the film industry going? Where do what do you think is currently happening in this climate? I feel like we're getting out of the strikes a little bit more, but it's a lot slower than people would have liked. You know, this, this, January is traditionally slow. Um, but I think that there's still a little bit of a dis-ease, right? That is what's coming. Um, are things expanding? Is, are, you know, is there as much availability for everybody? I think a lot, people are questioning a lot. So what do you think is going to happen in the film industry? It's amazing. I have no idea. <laughs> it's wonderful. No, I think what, you know, I do think everything is is interconnected. Mm-hmm. What we're experiencing right now has to be in some sort of counterbalance to the pandemic, right? The pandemic happened. We've ramped up, uh, the, the streamers ramped up production to their capacity and but now we're not all at home watching that much. So I think some of it must be a type of rebalancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know, but I remember uh, when, when I bought my, this, my first house, constantly month after month, just having anxiety, the mortgage, 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 mortgage. And an older woman said, Sherry, you have paid that mortgage every month for the last three years, even when you didn't know how you would do it. Mm-hmm. We don't have to worry about that one anymore. 
So I, I, I do feel like there's a resolve inside me mm -hmm. that I will discover and it will come to me the next gig or the next job or what type of job it is. Um, we make entertainment. And so that's not going to go away. I don't know what form it'll take. I remember someone, a professor asked this in college, was how do you see your film? And I said, I just have this Im image of being able to like be like half in bed, falling asleep or on the couch and just watching a movie wherever I want to. And this was right before iPhones came out. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't realize it till many years later. I'm like have my little movie screen right in my hand. So I don't know how it shifts, but I know it will. But I also know that I will find a way and, 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 and you know, adapt in some capacity. Mm -hmm. But um, there, the, 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 the TV shows, we will make them. The films, we will make them. They might not be that $50 million dog day afternoon, which they're not anymore. It might happen somewhere in, on TikTok or it might be in shorter forms or it might be a different type of TV. But mm -hmm. interestingly, all the streamers now are starting to look like cable again, right? Yeah. Here come the ad platforms and we're bundling again. Mm -hmm. But the the content and the work and the desire to make movies and television, it's still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you, because I, I think that the prep process for uh, every cinematographer is different and unique. Yeah. So let's talk about Drugstore June. Yeah. Talk to me about your prep process. How did that all happen? How do you go about your prep process? And uh, just so we can share it to uh, all our members. I think having a type of structure that can somehow hold all the different types of prep processes, because every film you seem like you're building a new car from scratch. Yep. And but there has to be a type of frame, right? Um, so I use uh, I use Studio Binder or Yamdu, mostly now Studio Binder. It's more of a, of a producer or production coordinators. Uh, software piece, yeah. which actually is, I think, my benefit because now I'm preparing to what they need and I can adapt it to my own my own um, needs. But that allows me to break down a script, uh, flag scenes for gear. It allows when we do a page flip, I have all my notes right there immediately. I'm not flipping through paper. Um, I think most of us are on scriptation to digitize now, so we know new drafts don't affect that too much. But um, so I had that, that sort of backbones my world. Shot Designer is an app that is so lo-fi. It's fast and great. It's gotten me out of many binds. Mm -hmm. On Drugstore June, we were we shot studio mode, classic E-series anamorphics. So we we're kind of slow and bumbly, which is great. Single cam. So that allowed us to be actually more nimble, but uh, we were on, you know, uh, dollies and lighting. So, But we came into a scene. It was a, a bust-up scene at a, at a pot store. And suddenly we have seven characters in a little shoebox. I start counting characters. I start counting coverage. And I start counting hours. I'm like, ah. So we throw it down to sh on um, Shot Designer. We have we just planned out a 16-hour day. We have half a day of shooting. So we just mobilized it, changed things. Said, oh, this is going to be a handheld scene. We're going to group these two over here. We're going to station this in a little triangle coverage. So we have a triangle and a back and forth, and then we can play a long shot. And uh, so that tool always comes in handy at different times of day. Mm -hmm. So I always have that on my on my phone. Uh, I organize my phone by lighting, camera apps, and office. So I can also get in and out of my phone quickly. I think having some of those structures in place allow me to move in a unique way with every show. On this one currently, I've really switched over to Apple Notes. I was always just keeping my own folder system in um, in my Mac, and then copy pasting or PDFing and emailing. But uh, some of my crew said, no, 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 do all this in notes. It's so fast. My call sheet's there, the lookbook is there, the next day schedule is there, the storyboards are there, if it's a scripted show, it's all there, it's so fast. There's notes or books? Notes, but should I look into book? You can do, you can put your lookbook in notes? Yes, I can make a folder. I can put my PDF in it. I can annotate it. I can copy it. It'll 
I can copy and start reading text. I can search within the lookbook. And so Oh wow, that's and so really now cool. like on my on my nightly hot sheets, I can go pull an image and just pull it and, and with Apple I can copy here and paste there. So I can be working sort of on my laptop mm-hmm. or on my computer in notes, but it's so I think finding some key structures mm-hmm. and software really, really help. Um it's sharing and drugstore June, Nick came in with his full lookbook and shot deck. Shot deck must have had three hundred images. And my first thought was like it's a, any this is a non it's every movie. You can't Yeah, yeah, exactly. What's going on? But through conversation, well, this image was for framing and this inter- image was for tone and this image was for color. And so shot deck, I don't know if you can, but would help to be able to organize it. But having those references and then on days we'd pull up the we'd pull up that image. This is what we're shooting, everyone. Just to let you know. this is the the feeling of the scene. Mm-hmm. Storyboards. Again, putting those in he had, I think, eight specific storyboards that he wanted to frame. And so on those days pulling them up and seeing we made that shot that you drew a year and a half ago. Right. That's awesome. Um you said something many years ago in one of your um podcasts or one of your series was getting ahead of production because that helps production and then it just makes you lead in the creative. And I think having these software, that's been one of my motives is how can I get in front of production? Yeah. And when I'm on set, that goes back to my collaboration with my team. Yesterday we were on a location, the director wanted to drive up, yet we had never been to the location before. I needed to go in with the gaffer, with Justin. And so Dan Kavanaugh, quick chit chat he took over with the director to make sure we got the, the drive up i was working with justin and so by the time the director came in to look at the next shot he had already communicated to his assistant because we had already had the conversation he was off and running in the lighting and then my ac already had my camera on set so we were rolling in that way so processes that are repeatable yeah. even though the actual project is different and i think that goes back to something i had pondered when we were talking about what we talk about was these universal experiences really only happen when you can get so specific into your one experience that you've had. So I think that's the, that's the juggle. There are universal, universal processes that can make this show the only way it could have been, but allow you to survive it too. <laughs> right. For, for sure. Yeah. I also talk with a lot of young cinematographers and they're like, how do you balance all these emails coming in and handling all this stuff? And, and while, while you're shooting, because production doesn't stop, you know, sending you all the latest and, oh, we got a tech scout. We got to go to the location. We lost the location. You know, all this is going on. And I was like, one of the most simplest ways I handle emails is by flagging. So my whole process is when the email comes in, if it's something that I can address right then and there, that if I do not answer it, there is going to be so much of a lag time mm-hmm. that there's go- it's going to have massive repercussions the longer I take to answer it, right? So anything that's like that, boom, I address immediately, right? Then if there's any things that are like, Yo, Shane, are we thinking about a seven o'clock call or we, you know, those kind of things, those have to be addressed immediately Mm -hmm. because that, that, that keeps the machine running. Right. But then when there's something that's something that doesn't need to be addressed like that hour or four hours, I'll flag it. And then I, on the way home, that hour and a half route or half hour, whatever it is, I'm able to look at what my flags are and then when I get home, address those flags and, you know, and then some. We don't, it's okay. We don't. <laughs> what? I have to it, say, you uh, had a driver, so you're not yeah, exactly. Yeah, we didn't have to. No, exactly. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah I had a driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't need that detailing and driving. We don't need that detail. But, but I think that... Uh, <laughs> But you know what I'm saying. It's like, these are the kind of things that help you. You really affected me. I remember early in my career, I would text or email you something and you would respond. And I was like, if he's working full time right now and can respond that quickly, I think I can do a little bit better job of responding as well. Because you you did, you had a system for saying like, 
I can I can get this off quick. This is a necessary. And um, I've done a lot of software experimenting, and I kind of ultimately started. I haven't tried flagging, which I will, but I've started filtering into all my onto folders. Right. And so I can see when the production folders has a new email. I can see when this project and. It allows me to move through that inefficiently. Yeah. yeah. And I think email can be one of those things that really bogs you down, um, especially when your focus needs to be, you know, on the monitor or on lighting or whatever else. And production is naturally set up. Shane and I talked about this the other day where it's like you check in the morning before you go to set to make sure that there's no fire emergency. You check at lunchtime when you have a break. And you're not actively doing your job. And then at the end of the day, you're checking again, which is actually batching emails, which is the best way to do it, not have it drain or waste your time. And within that, then you have your system, right? But it's, mm-hmm. it's really about batch checking because otherwise you can waste and have your time robbed the whole day. From just dealing with emails and and I I mean I I like that idea, uh, but as much as I want to batch it and say I only do it three times yeah. a day, there are uh, things that come up. questions yeah. that are coming in that that cannot be batched. Yeah. yeah, so I'm always on the ready of this thing because I I see when I don't answer an email mm-hmm. and then. Other people try to solve the problem when all I needed to say is 6 a.m. But the the banter goes back and forth. Well, we were talking about this in the production meeting that it was uh, da, da, and you start to he- see all yeah. this like seven, eight emails going back and forth where if I would have just said 6 a.m., none of that shit would have ever happened, mm-hmm. right? So there's, t- I, as much as I want to like, take my mind off my phone and not be on the email trail it the the efficiency of what you respond i think is very important to uh production understanding wow okay this guy's all over it he really wants to uh you know he he is he or she is balancing perfectly the ability to save money mm-hmm. be efficient and answer these questions so the yeah. machine can keep moving. Yes, and I think it does depend on the project because some projects you really are able to batch it. Right? Oh, yeah. And other projects you have to just be in there because a lot more is going on. Well, this last project I had, scheduling the actors was literally oh, the most difficult thing this AD had ever done. And I'm talking about we're shooting three days in Los Angeles and we were on double salmon schedule just for those three days by the time we went into production. Mm-hmm. It had changed that many times with availability. So those are the kind of things where when you have the schedule changing and everything like that and all of a sudden a night exterior is put on a day that we we're I thought I was showing up at 6 a.m. and done at 4 p.m., now it's night exterior. That's that's a whole other like I need a team. I yeah. we need riggers. We you know it's like all this start <laughs> and and this it's a it's a process that if no one speaks up and says anything, then all of a sudden the director is going to come in and we're like, why is this taking so long to light? We all knew this was on the schedule. You know, da da da. da. So it's it is you project know to project. project to project for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think. Being able to manage that communication as efficiently as possible is something that so many young cinematographers talk to me about because they're, mm-hmm. it scares the hell out of me when I look down and there's 97 emails and it's 7 a.m. and I showed up at 6 <laughs> yeah. and I was like, and I already answered them all when I was in my bed having my coffee when I was reading the script and and looking at my, you know, the schedule and all that kind of stuff, I had already gone through the 47, 50 emails mm-hmm. and answered those or deleted them because they were spam or whatever. But then to have that again in one hour, I'm like, oh, my God, this it, it can, you know, suck you in. And, yeah. you know, you know, what too, 
I think there was a point where I had the mindset of, oh, a, a job comes up, I'll go do the camera test and the lens test. We will all look at it, make decisions. It quickly became apparent, like with Drugstore June, we had a phenomenal three-week prep for the indie feature, almost longer prep than the shoot. That, But there's no time to test then. No. When they call you, you know already. Or you might get to have a couple little, you know, at the rental house looks. And so what's also become really important is to be testing and going to the vendor's locations throughout my non-working mm -hmm. time. And, and so I can start already be preparing for, oh, that one lens test or this new light that came out. That was kind of curious. I think this might be the show for it because when the show's here, it's already too late to discover. I mean, I always, I've found that hair and makeup tests are going away. They are, I mean, many productions are shocked when I say, oh, can hair and makeup come to Panavision? If I, if I can get a lens test at Panavision, please invite hair and makeup and wardrobe. Yeah. And hi. Well, because it's great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I, I didn't know. know that. That's crazy. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's the yeah. kind of thing where I love hair and makeup oh, tests so because good. it mm -hmm. gets the crew all like I will never forget. I was on Resident Alien, and we were building the Lutz and also doing hair and makeup at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I had a full like nine ten person in grip and electric and the <laughs> whole. And the producer goes, "I just want you to understand, Shane. This is a waste of money." right here that look at how you got your flying 12 by 20s you got 20 by 20s you got 18 k's what is going on here and i said we are warming up this is the best leading bonding experience i've never worked with any of these crew members before let's yeah. get us all together let's get us start to know our personalities start yeah. to learn everyone's names start to see who's fast and who's slow, or maybe we need to uh, correct here, but this is a litmus test mm -hmm. is what I see as hair and makeup. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a discovery at the same time, but it's also getting that crew together and almost, you know, blowing the cobwebs out it's a group. because <laughs> you know what, because yeah. it's, we're all working together for the first time and I find that that's almost every scenario on every job. Mm -hmm. You, I'm in Atlanta this year. I'm in Utah the next. I'm in Prague. Every crew is different. You can you can get maybe a couple key players that you've worked with in the past, mm -hmm. but most of the time it's all new blood. And how do you get that new blood into your personality and your style and every? Well, that's a hair and makeup test, mm -hmm. and that is the litmus test. And when he 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 when I said that. He stopped and he goes, I never thought of it that way. You're right. All right, fly some more shit. <laughs> all right. It was like yeah, so he true. was all that's on awesome. board yeah. once he realized. And I said, How many times have you been in production and you've reshot the first day? I had it happen on four or five movies, right? And it's because people were just not in the zone, not in the groove. Mm -hmm. I said, think about it. This, this is an investment, right? Mm -hmm. We're, this is an investment in, in getting us up to speed, getting our whole team, finding out the personalities and getting the efficiency going. We're already starting to move it and we're not even shooting yet. That to me is worth its weight in gold. And then the producer really saw it as that. And it was a great relationship uh, from that point on. I think so much if you can just across across the aisles or across the the, the departments just understand how, why are you doing that oh now i understand i'm on board yeah um, mm -hmm. i think that's it's, it's just so also cute. asking the question being curious yeah instead of this is not what you know yeah. yeah it's like and i a lot of times i'll go eh, it's not working and i'm like oh why why is this not working yeah you know it's better to say it like that mm -hmm. than this is not working why is this not working and Maybe because the light's not coming from the right side. Yeah, maybe you're mm -hmm. right. You know, and then you think about it. But yeah. curiosity uh, is, I mean, Lydia has helped me so much with that. Just keep on asking questions, mm -hmm. asking questions. And and don't try to also be the problem solver to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like, let them help you with solving those problems. And that's been a huge lift of stress off of me. Because 
I feel like I don't have to have all the answers. Yeah. And I don't know why I was down that road. I don't know. Maybe that's the way my mom led uh, because she did want to know everything and figure everything out mm -hmm. and and have all the solutions. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was that was kind of an example for me. Uh, but I don't know. I just whatever I'm trying to do now, I feel that, you know, the more years of experience, wisdom comes and softening and mm -hmm. you learn mm -hmm. Like it's, it's such a great process getting older. I actually, because it, it definitely, you see the, the wisdom that maybe, uh, my older mentors were telling me and mm -hmm. I could never listen to it back then. You or know, you, I was like, could... what are you talking about? Come on, let me, bu you know, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to push this dolly as fast as I can. And he goes, just so you know, you lift that like that for a long time. You're not going to be really lifting it for a long time. Yeah. So I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, and you're like, oh, Jesus. Something happened. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> Sherry, what uh, aha moments have you had or what do you think you've learned? Like Shane was just sharing. H have you had one of those moments where you're like, wow, all of a sudden it it's like an internal discovery? I, yeah. I am really enjoying getting older. Yeah. In the process of living and filming, I I love it. I love the process of being older because of some of the reflections you've mentioned. Yes, and the way you said that your aha moment was I don't have to know everything or solve every problem. The aha moment for me recently has been one of my first reactions is usually oh I like that or I don't, which is really if I unveiled it was I'm familiar with that I'm not, hmm. and so what I've caught, I catch that now because I. Because it still happens. I like that. I don't like that. I catch myself and I say one of two things. Can I learn something from this? Or what is the fact in this moment? Mm -hmm. Then when I just, for me, that's been my big shift lately. What is the fact in this moment? Now I can, now I can just handle the thing that is there without whatever I was, whatever the childhood. Where, and um, that's really, really helped me. Mm -hmm. Also, it's helped me let people in. Can I learn something from this? Not do I like or dislike? And it's allowed me to open up more, mm -hmm. be affected by others and ex other experiences, and then start trusting the process more. Because I'm, I'm, it's, it was a positive, it was a growth experience, or I have a new perspective now, or, oh, my perspective was also valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been a really big one for me. Most I think recently. trust is such an important thing because it's for filmmakers, trusting yourself, trusting the process of whatever's happening on set, trusting that your career is unfolding in the the way that it's meant to. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of that is, you know, you have to do the work and you have to put in the time and you have to try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think trust is a huge lesson that comes with each advancing decade. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful lesson. Great. So, Sherry, thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. We appreciate you so much. And uh, definitely follow Sherry's uh, courses and lessons within the platform. Uh, follow us on Instagram, our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see the podcasts on Filmmakers Academy, or you can be in your car and stream it on Spotify or Apple. And that concludes this edition of the Inner Circle Podcast.